Welcome, everyone. Is on? Yes, now it's on. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the uh, second day, the evening, the closing evening uh, plenary of the second day of the Global Uprisings Conference. Uh, we had many exciting discussions throughout the day today, and it is my pleasure now to introduce three, uh, three one in absence uh, speakers and uh, discuss them this evening. But before I do, I would like to make uh, three short announcements. Uh, the first one is that we will be having a, at the end of all the meetings tomorrow, for those of you who are still going, uh, we will be having an assembly meeting in a space very nearby to here. It's called the Vondel Bunker. And um, so we can carry on the discussion, so we can also talk about the way this conference happened, how it's working, how people are feeling, uh, different conversations that we haven't been able to have or that are not finished yet. We can hopefully uh, discuss uh, that way further for those of you who are still <laughs> energetic. Okay, so that's the announcement number one. Um, space created for that. The second uh announcement is about uh, our, we're currently trying to create a new panel tomorrow, so keep your eyes open. I can't we're still organizing it, but hopefully we will be having a second panel uh, tomorrow afternoon, an additional panel from the people from We Are Here, from the occupied building just down the road, uh, the migrant groups that have occupied that building. Uh, we'll hopefully come here and not just talk about what their experience is as migrants here, because there's a panel about migration tomorrow, but talk about what's happening in their own countries at home. It's still just, we're discussing, we're trying to make it happen. I really hope it will happen, so keep your eyes open for that. Uh, tomorrow, hopefully, in addition uh, to the conference. So, the final announcement is also don't forget the party tonight. Very important. Uh, the party will be at the Frankreich, and hopefully, many of you have already gotten this map from out front. So, the Frankreich is number one, star number one on this map. And uh, for the assembly, the Vondelbunker is also on this map, so you can have a look at that to find all the, the great places to be. Party starts right after the panel, so uh, you can head straight there afterwards. So, now all of the practicalities out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight uh, three esteemed scholars, although one is uh, in absentia. <laughs> uh, the first is George Cofensis. Here, and he will also read a paper by Silvia Federici, who we are very um, sorry cannot be here this evening, but we still wanted to have her ideas here. The paper that she wanted to present here, we still wanted to have that here tonight with us. So she will be with us in spirit, at least, uh, thanks to George, who is going to read her paper for us. Then we also have, and actually first we will have, uh, David Graeber, who also says you can uh, feel free to sit on the stage if you can't find enough space back there. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of room, he says, around here. And as our discussant this evening, we have Sabu Koso, who will put, pull together some of the ideas from the panelists as, he go, as they go along and draw some conclusions for us first before opening up the uh, discussion to everyone. So, with no further ado. What is your paper? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, this is working now. Good. Yes. Um, David Graeber, everybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're not going to tell me. All right. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I couldn't remember the title that I said I was going to do. Um, but, all right. Um, I thought I would um, introduce the two papers that are coming after by talking a little bit about the global situation in terms of social class because I think that there's been some real tectonic shifts in the potential for class alliances that, that make a lot of these global uprisings we've been talking about possible. Um, but um, we're only beginning to understand what's really going on. Um, a lot of it has to do with what I think are changing, well, the way the profits are extracted in capitalism itself are, are, are shifting. Um, perhaps there's a shifting of gravity within um, a system that already exists, but the shifts are quite profound. Um, one of the things that I think what we've been learning over the last few years is that 
there's been all this talk about the financialization of capitalism since at least the 70s. Um, and we talk about financialization as if it's all this kind of gambling scam that, um, you know, we're having. Um, more and more of the profits of capitalist firms are no longer coming from commerce, they're no longer coming from industry. Um, in either case, it's in the single figures percentage-wise in, in the US, for example. It's more and more from financial um, means. And people imagine this to be just sort of shuffling papers. It's all this kind of uh, magic trick where these guys sort of make up money out of thin air and convince people it's there. Um, it seems bereft from social relations, but I think it's becoming abundantly clear uh, as the age of financialization continues that there are indeed social relations involved here. Um, but these are social relations of a sort of direct and brutal kind, uh, which involve everyone in the world falling into debt. Um, that's what finance capital really is about. About. It's about um, capitalists essentially intervening in the political process to change legislative structures in such a way to guarantee that more and more of the population become indebted, and then using government coercive mechanisms to actually extract the money. It's really hard to get numbers on this, which is interesting, because for in America, for example, you have economic numbers on almost anything else. Um, but I've been trying to figure out what percentage of the average median American family household, for example, what percentage of their income is directly extracted by Wall Street by, uh, by one means or another, by the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. And it's really hard to come by the numbers, but it seems to be around 20 to 30 percent. It's really high. Uh, if you count not uh, just things like student loans and mortgages, but like all those um, interest uh, and penalties, huge numbers of penalties that they're always coming up with. And this stuff is done through, you know, essentially a what they call a democratic system, which has become a system of institutionalized bribery. They just like deal the politicians in a cut of this, or actually a very small cut, uh, and then they, the corporations themselves get to write the laws by which they're supposedly regulated. So by describing this whole thing as deregulation is the ultimate, you know, bullshit. Uh, it's an ultimate lie because you know what we're really talking about is a massive uh, regulation in the corporations' favor, which is constantly going on. But I think this has really interesting effects on on how people perceive themselves. Um, I saw a poll not long ago which said that for the very first time since they've been doing polls in the United States, a majority of Americans did not consider themselves middle class. And I thought that was really impressive and, 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 and significant because I've always felt that middle classness isn't really an economic category. Um, Middle classes is a political and a social category. Essentially, when, you know, if I have a sort of handy rule of thumb definition of what is middle class, being middle class means, um, you know, if you see a policeman and you feel more safe rather than um, less safe, you're probably middle class, right? <laughs> and you know, that's why most people in a country like America have thought of themselves as middle class, and you know, maybe very small percent of people in Nigeria or Pakistan consider themselves middle class. Cops are scary there, and. Um, um, so essentially what being middle class means is that you feel the institutional structure uh, sh should be there for you. You know, essentially that's what it's there for, for people like yourself, to protect your property, to protect your interests, your educational system should be working for you. Even the financial system should be working basically for you. Actually, um, I think that's the definition of middle class. You feel that the system is actually, you know, ought to be there for you. Um, or, or ultimately does work for you. Uh, someone offered a, a um, additional sort of corollary, which is if you feel that way and you're right, then you're upper class. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so essentially, um, if you're suddenly caught in a situation where there's some sort of robo signing, rip off, mortgage thing, where they like, um, where they are repossessing your house on obviously a legal basis, but somehow the police aren't prosecuting the people who repossessed your house on a legal basis, but are there forcing you out of your house, you know, suddenly it's, it doesn't really matter what your income is. You, it's really hard to think of yourself as being particularly middle class at that moment. And I think that's essentially what's happening. This sort of uh, 
You know, there's endless discussions in the Marxist literature of what is the role of the state under capitalism. Is it basically there to guarantee property rights? Is it there to mediate social disputes? But you know, as capitalism goes into this financialized mode where you're replacing indirect um, profit, like extracted through the wage, in the way we're all familiar with from Marx, you know, to a larger and larger percentage of the profits of capitalism are just directly taken out of your pocket forcibly. What's that? Faster. Faster. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, um, as you are heading towards a situation <laughs> where a larger and larger percentage is, is simply taken directly, um, the, the state itself is simply part of the apparatus of, of, of extraction of surplus value. Um, in much the way we are used to thinking of as under feudalism. I'm not saying this is feudalism, but it much more resembles feudalism than more tr w w the way we conceptualize capitalism. So people's attitudes toward the state shift. I think that this allows for different sorts of class alliance. Um, I think that a lot of what we saw in Occupy Wall Street was made possible by this um, in America. You know, 30, 40 years ago, if a bunch of indebted students and um, people struggling with student loans had started a protest, um, they would n this would not have been the kind of issue which would have immediately won the hearts of New York transit workers and uh, construction workers, other unionized labor. Uh, suddenly we had enormous support from unionized labor. And I think part of the reason is because uh, the working poor and people struggling with student loans were the two groups that were really completely unable to get themselves out of debt traps after 2008, after the financial collapse. Um, so people's structural relation to capital itself is shifting in dramatic ways, which allow class alliances that, that couldn't have existed before. So what I want to throw out is, is two suggestions. Um, I want to say that in certain ways, in this new sort of, uh, ec sort of class landscape, um, the right wing has been rather clever at, at capitalizing on this and, and, and mobilizing these new forms of class resentments in a way that they've taken advantage of it, if anything, more than the left. But I think that this is a, a temporary thing and that ultimately the situation really plays into the hands of anti-capitalists much more than they. Um, so I'll, I'll give two different um, analyses very briefly of, of how I think the right wing has done this, but how, how even understanding that opens the way to see where our own advantage lies strategically. Um, one has to do uh, it, with what has to do with resentment of work which pursues values other than the economic, economic value. That basically working class people really hate what they call the cultural elite. Um, what phenomena um, I've noticed a lot in America. America is like the you know the great uh, experiment zone for various forms of right wing populism, um, where they have like hundreds of people working every day trying to figure this stuff out. Um, uh, you know, majority of psychologists and sociologists in America are actually employed you know, uh, in manipulating people rather than analyzing people. Um, and, um, and they've come up with some good ideas. Um, so one of them has, like why, I always wonder why is it that, that right-wing populism is so effective in America and why is it it seems that the two kind of slogans that really seem to move people the most, one of them is like hatred of the cultural elite, you know, they, uh, ordinary working class people in America seem to resent people who are in cultural production more than they hate the economic elite. I mean, they don't really like the economic elite very much. They really hate, you know, the, the cultural elite. Um, and the other is this obsession of the military and supporting the troops. You know, it seems odd to imagine these two things would be in any way related, but it always struck me that if you could figure out how they were related, this would reveal something really profound about why this, this kind of stuff works. Um, I thought about it and I realized that, that well, you know, looking at this from the perspective, say you are a air conditioner repair guy in Nebraska, uh, or truck driver in Louisiana, someone like that. Um, if, if you, know, you can imagine a scenario where if you have a kid and that kid is very smart and enterprising, that kid might become a CEO. 
You know it's really unlikely you know, that they're going to become a capitalist, but it could happen. But you just can't imagine any scenario where you're... What, what? Excuse me? <laughs> well, well, well. Um, sorry, I can't understand you. Um, you, know, you can't imagine any scenario in which um, your kid will ever become drama critic for the New York Times. Um, What's this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, like someone, you can imagine a scenario where your kid might be. Did you get drugs? What's what? Excuse me. What? What's up? <laughs> Are you gonna just do this again and again? Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, you can imagine a scenario in which your kid might become rich. You know, it's not likely. But, you know, you can't imagine any scenario in which your child will ever become an international human rights lawyer or a drama critic for the New York Times. You know, and, and you're right. I mean, if you thought that, because those barriers are actually much higher. Um, the breaking into the cultural elite is actually much harder than uh, the economic elite. Um, because, you know, there's this whole panoply. I mean, I, I, I come from a working class background, a rather educated one, but, you know, even I, like, knew that there were jobs I could never dream of getting because you need to do, like, two or three years of unpaid internships. And basically, there any job where you're not just in it for the money. If you're trying to pursue any form of value other than economic, if you want to go into culture, if you want to go into charity, if you want to go into journalism, if you, you know, you want to pursue truth or beauty or art or, you know, forget it. You have to live in New York on no money for two years, which you can't do unless your parents are rich. Um, so there's all these elaborate series of barriers. Um, so essentially, you know, if you come from a working class background, you see these guys who grabbed all the jobs where you can get, you know, pursue something other than mere economic value and also get paid. Um, if you want to do something noble, which pursues something beyond, you know, uh, which you think of as pursuing something beyond mere economic value and get paid for it, and you come from a working class background, you really have one option. You can join the army. Um, so hence the whole we hate the cultural loops, really support the troops sort of sounds, accidentally makes sense. I remember seeing a study um, a friend did of, of, they have all these programs um, around American military bases where they send out the troops to like, you know, give free dental checkups and literacy campaigns and for people around the base. And supposedly it's like to improve opinions about having soldiers around. It doesn't work. Um, they find time and time again that it really doesn't affect public opinion about having troops there. But they continue them because they discover that um, it has profound effects on the troops. Uh, that people are three times more likely to re-enlist if they get to do this stuff. And I started to realize all these guys, they don't really want to be in the military. They want to be in the Peace Corps. But you can't get into the Peace Corps unless you've been through college, basically, unless you're a rich kid. So, you know, it's, it's an example of, um, that essentially they play on this popular resentment of this elite that they see as getting all the jobs where you get to do something good and noble. Then I realize there, the phenomenon happens in reverse as well, because there's an equal amount of mobilization of popular resentment against people who get to do actual productive work. And I think this is like a new phenomena which really hasn't been discussed and documented. Why is it that people, it's so easy to get people angry at teachers or, or auto workers when they expect benefits and other, you know, um, reasonable levels of wages. Um, and I actually wrote a piece which was a hypothesis about this, and I think if any, ever anything has been confirmed by the reaction this has, I'm, two minutes, oh, this is a disaster. All right. Um, okay, I am, okay, I can go. Um, it's, it's, um, it was, be the reaction to this was really quite remarkable. Um, and I wrote a piece called, it was called On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs. Because um, you know, I was kind of wondering, well, why is it that, you know, you have all these people who seem to be not doing anything in their jobs. You know, human relations consultants, I'm a researcher for a marketing firm. Um, you know, all the, there's a layer on layer of jobs which don't seem to actually fulfill any function. And I was a little bit inspired by this, by the experience of my father who actually fought in Spain. And he was in Barcelona during the revolution there. And he always thought it was one of the great social experiments. He said, well, basically what they did in the Spanish revolution was they just got rid of all the white collar workers. Um, 
chased them off, shot them, whatever. And, um, and they discovered, to their surprise, that those guys don't actually do anything. Um, you know, they just carried on pretty much as they had before. Um, so you know, mostly those guys are just there to like, figure out reasons to make you feel bad about yourself. Um, they don't actually contribute anything to society. Um, and um, and, if, and that was in the 30s, where there weren't really many of them. Um, the number of those sort of people has actually tripled since then. They've gone from like 25% of the workforce to 75% of the workforce. Um, well, actually, that's service, clerical, and administrative. But still, it's like it's gone up hugely. And it's almost as if, like, it's almost... I think of it as, as the Sovietization uh, of capitalism. You know, you have all these endless make work jobs, and this is exactly what capitalism isn't supposed to be doing, creating these jobs that don't actually do anything. But whereas the Soviet system created, like, proletarian jobs that didn't, weren't really necessary and where people just wasted their time. Um, you know, the capitalist system is creating administrative and clerical jobs where people don't really do anything. Um, and, and so my hypothesis was this. I think the pe maybe the people in these jobs actually know that they're just doing bullshit, um, that their jobs are completely meaningless and contribute nothing. And um, imagine what it does to their soul, you know? Think about that. <laughs> um, you know, here, here I am. I mean, how can you have dignity in labor if here I'm sitting in the office every day secretly believing my job does not need to exist? Um, <laughs> We don't think about the sort of moral and psychological damage that must do to people. And, and um, so I wrote this piece, and like within three weeks, the piece had been translated into 14 different languages. And it was being widely circulated in like financial services listservs. You know, so uh, if ever the hypothesis was confirmed by the reaction, and there were all these blogs where people were saying things like, yeah, oh my god, it's true, I'm a corporate lawyer, I contribute nothing to society. <laughs> I'm miserable all the time. <laughs> so I realize that this kind of resentment of this sort of professional managerial class doing these bullshit jobs is actually turned around as a kind of weapon to reinforce capitalism because they work more and more because they feel bad about the fact that their work is meaningless. Um, and then like, they deeply resent people who get to have jobs that actually do something. Because how else can you explain this sort of hatred of teachers, you know? Um, or, 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 or auto workers, you know, uh, if not to, it's like, they're essentially saying, but you guys get to make cars, you know? You guys get to teach children, that's like real work, you know? And you want benefits too, you know? <laughs> so, so, okay, so this is how the right wing is sort of grasped onto this, this very strange class dynamic that, that um, has, has emerged from financially oriented capitalism to reproduce itself. But I think that within, Within that, you know, what we're seeing is this terrible yearning for a job that actually means something. Um, and ultimately, I think that this is, can only play to the advantage of forces that want to reconstitute society in, in, in a less crazy way. And, and I was inspired, I think, in this respect by looking at the... Has anybody looked at the We Are the 99% Tumblr page that came out um, in Occupy? There's a whole discussion of this, of uh, what does it mean that there are all these people holding up little signs, like giving their life histories, and they always ended, I am the 99%. Um, and a long discussion of the sort of demands, I'm, I'm closing up, um, that were on it. Uh, but the thing that really struck me about the, the, those people and sort of surveying this was about 70 80 percent of them were women. Um, it was largely women were jobs in uh, some sort of social service provision, medical or educational areas. But even the guys were mostly also in that or complaining about the fact they couldn't do something like that. Uh, but So the overall complaint was essentially like, I want to do a job that A, isn't bullshit, and B, actually help somebody. Um, and as I pointed out in the bullshit jobs piece, there seems to be a general principle in capitalism that the more obviously your work benefits other people, the less they pay you, right? Um, but that was essentially what it was about. Um, that, you know, I, 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 you know, I ha want to do a job where I can't hate myself, I don't hate myself, um, where I'm actually somehow doing something to benefit others. But if you insist on having a job where you do something to actually care about other people, they're going to pay you so little and put you so deeply in debt that you're not going to be able to take care of your own children, your own family. Now, this is like the central contradiction of finance capitalism, I think. And I think that's what drove that sort of sense of profound 
indignation. But I think within that is the seeds for a total new way of really conceptualizing what labor is and is all about. And I think that we need to go back again. And, and you know, one thing that, that unfortunate theoretical tendency we have is to, when we see something radically new emerge, rather than reimagine history and think, well, what does this tell us about what's always been there but was been invisible to us? You know, we, uh, we say instead, oh, the world totally changed in 1975 and now we live in a new age. Um, so I think that, that you know, we li- I think that we really need to like relook at history from this vantage and, and suddenly it looks very different. Um, and thinking of all this, uh, for example, Paul Mason in his introductory talk, right, was talking about the network and how we have these networks now and social networks and this is changing everything r- dramatically um, as if this is a new phenomena. Well, I mean, throughout history there have been people creating and maintaining social networks which make capitalism possible. Uh, they were called women, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, this has like always been relegated to the sort of work that's made invisible, whereas a guy you know, which creates a platform for the guys to go out and do things that, that um, they get the credit for. Same is true when they talk about immaterial labor and the labor of creating you know um, all that work around the commodities and around products uh, the style of fashion you know it's all the stuff that um, suddenly now it's white guys are doing that they didn't used to do before suddenly everybody discovers it and thinks it's like suddenly new but it's not um, I, I think what we need to do is look at these forms of, of labor which are now coming to the forefront of social struggle and realize that these are always the things that were the, the core of labor I mean what what people are you know what society is is a vast form production where we make each other and shape each other. Um, this is always the primary form of labor and other forms of labor are simply auxiliary to that. Um, and uh, if once we start a um, conceptualizing things in that way, we realize that, uh, I think we will realize that, that all the seeds for sort of revolutionary alliances are already emerging even at, um, right around us even now. Yeah. Um, my name is George Kafensis. Uh, I'm not Sylvia Federici. <laughs> but you will be tonight. <laughs> Halfway. Okay. <laughs> then I return to my role as George Kafensis. So um, uh, Sylvia is, could not be here this evening, but uh, she wanted to be here. Um, because it's a very important for her, because a, a year ago she came to uh, uh, the Netherlands and she had a number of interviews with uh, uh, workers in the cleaners union here and uh, it had a very profound impact on her and she wanted to give it back in some way or other and unfortunately her own health intervened and um, she wasn't able to come. Uh, but. As I said, she wants to make sure that um, the Netherlands plays a role here in in our deliberations and the work of these women, especially, uh, be recognized. So, um, and uh, because the issue that we're dealing with, of course, is is an issue of visibility and invisibility. These might not be great terms, but they bring out something, I'm afraid, that's very powerful. Um, So... If you bear with me, I'll read this paper. I've read it before, and it's about 20 minutes or so. Okay, and uh, and the audience here, I've seen, I've been here the last couple of days, and you're very uh, patient, and uh, I appreciate uh, the confidence that you have in the speakers here. Um, okay, uh, we have seen other countries and have another culture, is the uh, quote from the beginning. Immigrant domestic workers and the international production and circulation of feminist knowledge and organization. Over the last three decades, the experiences and working conditions of immigrant domestic workers have been at the center of a growing body of sociological and feminist literature. Um, This literature has examined the policies that have sparked off women's migratory movements, highlighting the contradictions that immigration generates in the communities of origin that many abuses to which immigrant domestic workers are exposed, and the new divisions the globalization of care introduces among women. Concepts like global care chains have given us a new understanding of the transformations that have taken place in the international division of reproductive work. 
There is, however, <coughs> another aspect of the experience of immigrant domestic workers that deserves more attention. Through the daily cross-cultural exchanges required by the negotiations with employers and international authorities, and through the creation of multinational communities and organizations fighting for basic women's rights, immigrant domestic workers have become a leading force in the shaping of an international feminist perspective. They have become the protagonists of a global circulation of practices and knowledges that are transforming feminist politics, contributing to articulate new forms of subjectivity and a more cosmopolitan feminism. We should not overgeneralize and overlook the plurality of experiences and work conditions, of course, that define the, the situation of domestic workers internationally. Clearly, there's no homogenous domestic workers experience, but there is no doubt if we consider the struggle they are making and the organizations they have created to assist each other and change their status, that domestic workers constitute a new women's movement that expands the feminist problematic of the 1970s, bringing to reproductive work a perspective shaped by the history of slavery and colonial relations. The fact that migrant domestic work has come to the center of attention of radical politics internationally is proof of this reality. There are, there are several reasons for this phenomenon. Not, no less than other forms of migration, the migration of women from the global south or from Eastern Europe to work as domestic workers cannot be considered only a product of necessity. The decision to leave one's country, one's family, even one's children is a difficult one and always involves a struggle. Those who decide to migrate are strong women prepared to face many hardships, even a loss of social status to improve their lives and expand their possibilities. Many in their country of origin have some employment and even professions, although devalued by economic liberalization. Migration itself is a learning process, negotiating with agencies over documents, acquiring contracts, references, learning to adjust to different cultures and languages and countries, living with strangers, often in conflicting situations, are life-changing experiences that produce a profound subjective transformation. Most domestic workers, moreover, come from countries that have been or are sites of broad social movements and have strong traditions of working class struggle and communal relations. Often they come from countries where the domestic workers are, have attained a legal status, at least on paper, superior to that of domestic workers in the United States, for example. Thus they bring with them a knowledge of policies and struggles that enable them to organize against the exploitation they suffer where they work. Furthermore, because of the particular conditions of their employment, which takes place in secluded social and physical spaces, domestic workers have had to invent forms of organizing capable of breaking their isolation, their invisibility. Forced often by migration policies as well as by economic necessity to take positions as live-in workers and reside in households where they have no autonomy and hardly any control over their space and time. For example, the right to lock their rooms is still not generally granted. Their first organizational step has been connecting with other women. At first, they have come together with domestic workers from their own country, speaking the same language, sharing the same cultural background. Later, they have worked with domestic workers from other parts of the world, providing a reference point for new arrivals, helping them with papers and information about housing, employment, fighting to change the laws, learning to hold rallies, lobby politicians, building multinational organizations and networks. In Holland, domestic workers, mostly from the Philippines and Indonesia, have founded the United Migrant Domestic Workers in the Netherlands. They've also joined the Domestic Workers Campaign of the Netherlands. They've allied with the uh, FNV uh, Bongenoten. Did I pronounce that right? Bongenoten? Okay, the, the Dutch Union, especially its cleaners section, as well as other migrant organ, uh, workers' organizations, and the Wereld Wees. Is that right? Wereld Wees? A center of uh, undocumented migrants in Amsterdam. In this, capacity, in this capacity, although they work all week, Monday to Saturday, and have families to care for, 
the immigrant domestic workers in Amsterdam provide assistance on legal issues, labor cases, arrest, asylum, healthcare issues, including maternity, housing, education. They also provide training, information, organize meetings, events, as, as panels, as participants, also as organizers, and engage in research, writing articles, reports, newsletters, proposals, and position papers. So a lot of work going on here in the Netherlands, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there is, this is reverberating in many of your experiences. Um, Indeed, there's a story still to be written about the new organizational practices and forms of sociality that women from India, Nepal, Africa, the Caribbean islands, Latin America have created in towns across the world, enabling them to cooperate and create powerful forms of resistance despite their different languages. None of this would have been possible without a redefinition of their relation to public space. Seen at first as a place of danger, where you could be stopped by police, asked for papers, abused, public space has become for domestic workers a place of autonomy and encounters, a place where to be on their own, break the isolation of work, and reach out to a broader public, gaining visibility for their demands. Filipinas have led in this way, seeking social spaces in which to gather on their days off or on Sundays, parks, churches, more recently rented apartments. In some countries, for example in Hong Kong, they've gone to the streets, staging weekly public performances, singing, dancing, acting out the problems inherent in their lives and work experiences. In this process, transforming the urban landscape into a commons, having a presence in the territory, occupying the territory. The street, the sidewalk, the park is a practice uh, dictated not only by their need to break one's isolation, but by the realization that an essential condition for challenging the restrictions resulting from immigration policies and their work conditions is to become visible and make one's story known. According to Priscilla Gonzalez of New York Domestic Workers Union, one of the most uh, important domestic workers organizations in the United States, this has proven to be a very effective way of organizing. By making their stories known, immigrant domestic workers have not only strengthened their solidarity bonds and circulated their experiences, but have developed a consciousness of their condition as women and a broader understanding of the consequences of globalization for them and their communities. There are other ways in which the experience of migrant domestic workers have been transformed and have transformed feminism. In struggling to improve their conditions and valorize their work, they have redefined what domestic work involves in ways that benefits all women and creates the basis for recomposition among them. In the United States, for instance, domestic workers have been fighting to change a labor legislation dating back to the 1930s that still denies them the status of workers. Yes, when the famous labor laws that were put together in the 1930s in the New Deal there was a question, was, was the maid, was the nanny uh, a worker? And it was explicitly denied and said, no, they're not workers. And in fact, since that time to today, with two exceptions, the state of New York and the state of California just recently has changed that situation, so they're now considered workers. Um, that still denies them the status of workers, not recognizing domestic labor as real labor, but in fact now this is what has happened. There was, there was a huge theoretical debate among Marxists in the 1970s about this matter, but that debate seems to have just been rolled over by the process of history and struggle. So uh, yes, it is real labor, and a major breakthrough in this context was the recognition in only of November 2010 by New York State legislation, legislature of a bill of rights that Domestic Workers United had campaigned for in many years. Earlier this year, the same bill was approved at last by Governor of California, Jerry Brown, after he rejected it in 2012. Domestic workers, yes, he said, oh, it would make it difficult to hire these uh, workers. He used the classic example, but he was forced to redeal with the, the bill and then he signed it just a few weeks ago. Um, 
Domestic worker struggles have also affected international policies. In June 2011, they have scored a landmark victory when the ILO Convention, the International Labor Organization Convention, uh, 189 extended global labor standards guaranteeing to domestic workers protections equivalent to those of other workers. Not last, domestic workers are changing the image of the house worker from that of a self-effacing person to that of a woman who is combative, knows her rights, is prepared to fight back when abused, and is well aware that her work is fundamental to her family's survival. In this way, domestic workers can be seen as role models for other women, including those who employ them. In sum, domestic workers are today emblematic of a new feminist identity, fluid, multicultural, constantly in the making, a product of continued negotiations between the constraints of the international and sexual division of labor and the new forms of cooperation and resistance generated by it. Their struggles their struggle suggest the possibility of a feminism conceived not as a set of values to which we must conform, but as an opposition to gender-based discrimination inspired by a cosmopolitan history of women's struggles. Equally important is the fact that as nannies, domestic workers are raising children who in many cases spend more time with them than with their mothers. As Sandra Mazadra points out, there's an interesting contradiction in this situation. For the fact that domestic workers, mostly women of color, have, are disparaged on, on racial grounds and yet are those who care for our children, in quotation marks, produces a tension that can be politically productive. Here, too, the most immediate consequence has been the circulation of knowledge and culture. Children in New York now know stories about practices and habits in Kenya or in Trinidad because of the stories their nannies tell them before they go to sleep. Their mothers are well, uh, are as well learn about domestic practices and different conceptions of what mothering entails. In the current economic crisis, domestic workers are sources of information about economic policies that have already experienced their spreading to areas of the world in which they have landed. Ironically then, women who are supposed to be subordinate, to be specialized in the work of affect, are sources of important knowledge about the trends shaping the contemporary capitalist world and the resistance that people internationally are mounting against them. In other words, using categories popular in Marxist autonomous circles, we can say that domestic workers are not only effective workers, but cognitive workers, often more cognizant of the international politics than their own employers. It may be the case that some of the violence that they are subjected to, and we know a lot about that now, um, is an attack on this inversion of roles that it often leads to. The unease, and even the unease, even some feminist feminists experience with regard to women they nevertheless employ, is certainly intensified by the recognition of their knowledge. This is a, this is acknowledged in an interview that Pascal Molinier has conducted with some Parisian feminists, who admit that they wish their f female employees remained invisible to them as their knowledge, experience, and culture stand in their eyes as a condemnation of their status to which they are confined and to their own contribution to it. So <coughs> this is uh, Sylvia's um, contribution to our uh, discussion about global uprisings. This is a, an important global uprising of which we have uh, a branch right here. And uh, <laughs> look forward to your comments. Just one minute. Now I go through another transformation of identity. Just call me George. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, David uh, started us off with a discussion of work and uh, debt, and uh, in a way, uh, we 
we dealt with uh, an important expansion of our notion of work here in Sylvia's paper. And I'm going to speak about uh, debt. Uh, not so much uh, debt per se, but the creation of the making of a debtor's movement the, in the United States. Because uh, I discovered, uh, you know how things are politically, you, you kind of back into things. But uh, during the uh, Occupy Movement's developments in 2011, um, I found myself at the end of uh, Occupy being part of a, a debtors organization. It was called Occupy Student Debt Campaign. Um, and then within a few weeks, a few months, excuse me, uh, of that time, I joined another uh, organization, a, de a debtors organization called Strike Debt. Okay, and I'm still a member of that organization, although I'm not here to represent it, but I'll give you my thoughts about it. Um, because more importantly, it's what happened uh, with uh, joining these organizations that I began to think about for the first time uh, in any serious way, um, not only debt, but also where are the debtors' movements in history? And where are they now? Uh, because one would have thought that after 2008, there would have exploded in the United States a, um, a huge debtors' movement descending upon Washington, D.C., having hundreds of thousands of people. Let's say, for example, we know that there are about six million um, student debt defaulters in the United States. Even, okay, we, we have some student debt exilers, maybe. Okay. Uh, okay, well, um, but we, your, your energy and enthusiasm didn't quite appear <laughs> on the scene uh, in 2000, in, between 2008 and the present. There has been no major, for example, uh, demonstration of, even more importantly, the people who have been foreclosed. In, uh, we're talking about tens of millions of, uh, of households that have faced foreclosures in the last 10 years. And one would have thought such a vital, a vital part of one's life attacked so openly. I mean, it, it is tough, right, David? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's the, the I'm also a part of strike debt, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what what happens is that, um, uh, and so I I began to ask myself the question: Well, why is it that uh, we we're now beginning to have some organizations? but we don't have a huge movement which we ought to have. And um, so I began to think about this story and um, you know, began to try to understand uh, some of the problems of organizing uh, debt, debtors um, together with um, other, uh, other debtors, how we put them together. And um, I also began to think about the many different forms of debt that there wasn't just one kind of debt, but there were many, many different kinds of debt, and many of them are played against each other. And uh, so I wanted to uh, you know, then go on to see, there's a long history. Uh, David, in his really great book um, on debt, uh, follows 5,000 years okay, of, of debt. Uh, but even if one cuts it down to 2,000 years, uh, one still has plenty. <laughs> one has we ha one has lots of experiences about debtors' struggles in the ancient days, uh, but um, when we look at, uh, for example, the United States, we have very few important uh, massive debtors' movements, and uh, these are th the question is well, why not? I mean, it's such an important aspect of our lives, and uh, I began to try to see. Uh, by looking at the, the, the history of debtor struggles and uh, the history of debtor struggles, especially in the United States and in Mexico. Mexico is a very important place uh, for studying this matter. Um, so the first thing that I noticed about uh, debt and why it has some such difficulties is because 
Well, most of the organizations I've been involved with have in one way or another been involved with um, wages or working conditions or both. This is a very open way in which the class struggle expresses itself here in the Netherlands and in the United States and in many parts of the world. Well, the center of attention has been the wage relation. Uh, the debt relationship has in recent times, although very important, that debt relationship has a very different meaning. And it, uh, I, it really struck me uh, when uh, I first started doing work with, the, uh, with student debtors that uh, a lot of the student debtors were ashamed to ex express the fact that they are in debt. This has been a, a very important part of my recognition that actually uh, debtors and their debt relationship uh, compared to the wage relationship is quite different. And the type of organization, the type of politics that is appropriate to debt is not necessarily appropriate to wage relation. Uh, partly because, well, the debt individualizes the debt makes you, uh, in a sense, want to hide your, your, your status as a debtor. Wage, the wage relationship is not hideable, number one. And number two, you might want to have, you might be ashamed of your low wages, but you want to have more, okay? So um, the relationships of wage and debt is, um, it's very important to understand. I mean, take, take a very simple thing like the time, relationship with time. For example, in a debt relationship, you get the money first and you're supposed to pay back later, right? And a lot of the, the terror that's involved in debt is concentrated in that gap, that temporal gap. The creditor wants to terrorize you because they've already given you the money. The wage relationship is exactly the opposite in terms of time, right? You work first, right? You work first and then they pay you later. And that, 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 that's very simple in terms of the, the structural relationships, but they have many, many, many consequences in the way in which workers organize versus the way debtors organize. Or it seems to me very clear that um, it's very hard for you, when you're on your job, you know that the, the person next to you is on the job, and vice versa. But when you're a debtor, you don't know necessarily the person who's sitting next to you is in debt or not. There's nothing explicit about it. Now, the question of debt is, of course, not only in terms of the relationship and the difference, although it's very important. I, I'm, I, I am sort of an instinctual wage being. I still have not yet gotten into thinking in terms of how you organize around debt. Um, but it seems to me that one of the most important issues concerning debt is the fact that there are many different varieties of debt. And um, let, let me give you an example. In a class society, we tend to think that uh, debt, debt is perhaps one thing. You get into debt and it means uh, a whole set of consequences. But actually in a class society, we have uh, four different types of debt that are, are quite different in terms of their consequences. And if they're confused, can have grave uh, limitations on your struggle. He, let me give you an example of these four different forms of, of uh, debt. One is when capitalists give or lend money to capitalists uh, in order to make more money, okay? That's one thing. Then when capitalists lend money to workers, that's another kind of debt. That kind of debt, in fact, when, we, when we're talking about um, official financial organizations like banks lending money to workers, that's a relatively recent development in history. It was only when the wage itself began to become more stabilized that uh, you could use the wage to be something like a collateral for, for loans. But for a long period of time, uh, work, the working class 
had no necessary relationship with the financial, with the financial institutions. So when uh, uh, capitalists got together to, to talk about interests and so on, working class never in, entered into it up until relatively recently. Of course, that's changed tremendously. Now, but there are other kinds of debt as well. When workers lend to capitalists, that, that's a very important kind of debt, right? It, uh, that's, that's, for example, pensions, right? I mean, that's a form of, of debt where workers, in fact, go out and they give money to capitalists in the form of bonds, right? And um, then finally, there's a form of debt that arises from workers lending money to other workers. That's, uh, I think, I, I, that, that's a statistic that's not so easy to get, mm -hmm. okay? Um, because... Think about it uh, right now. How many times have you given a, a friend or, or a child or a, um, um, a, a, a workmate, somebody that you uh, play ball with? It, it happens all the time, and it's, wi it's quite widespread. And these four different kinds of debt, for example, they have within them a different kind of morality, and a different kind of um, a political economy, you might say. And, and so therefore, for example, we are called strike debt, all right, uh, the organization I'm part of. Um, but we don't want to strike the debt that the capitalists owe to us, right? Uh, and, and much of the questions, many of the moral questions that arose uh, that whenever you're dealing with, with debt, when people say that, oh, it's my moral obligation to pay back. Now, a good part of the work that we do in strike debt is to try to undermine the legitimacy of that argument. But we have to also recognize that one of the reasons why that, that argument is there is that there is a form of debt that, yes, there, there is a moral responsibility. It's the relationship between worker and worker. When worker and worker enter into a relationship of indebtedness, uh, another kind of moral relationship happens because you lend to a fellow worker not to make money out of it, but to help that person out. It's one of the basic relationships of, of the commons. And uh, so, in, in fact, it's very important to distinguish between that kind of debt and the kind of debt that we talk about uh, in um, strike debt, which is the, the debt that, what, that capitalists lend and create when they lend to workers. That kind of debt, as we now know, is, 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 is an illegitimate debt, and uh, we have been developing uh, arguments that, to show that it's illegitimate in strike debt. And that's one of the reasons why we've had this, uh, this thing called um, uh, the Rolling Jubilee. It, it's, it, it, well, basically, we, we buy debt and, on pennies on the dollar of the original debt and then write it off. Now, that kind of, um, uh, the, the whole point of that exercise is to show that, in fact, the standard kind of debt that workers get into is totally fictional. It really, it, its its consequences are built upon the kind of social relations that uh, David here has been talking about. But uh, we have to also realize that there's, uh, when we just speak of debt, and we we have quite different models. Yes, we don't want the, the capitalists to renege on their on their uh, uh, on paying back their bonds to support our pensions. These are we're not saying that that's illegitimate. That, that's the, of course. So we want to be able to create a uh, a conception of debt that we're very sure that 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 separates out in order to make sure that uh, the the kind of the kind of uh, politics that we're discussing and the kind of ethics that we're discussing will not, are not violating what we would call our common sense. And uh, this, is, this is a sort of important point, it seems to me, when 
in order to understand a lot of the confusion that takes place and a lot of the, in a way, the self-hatred. That's another thing that we discovered in doing uh, this work around debtors' organizations, uh, which had to do with the fact that how often have we had debtors basically cursing debtors who have been trying to fight against their status. How often have I heard, well, I paid off my loan, uh, why shouldn't the others do the same? That type of um, continual uh, sense of, uh, in effect, eventually self-hatred, because when you, had, when you hate debtors and you yourself are a debtor, eventually it comes back to you. But <coughs> this, this, uh, this very careful uh, need to uh, separate out the different kinds of debt are parts of our story because yes, these debtors who hate debtors uh, are coming out of a, uh, a, an inability to distinguish between what's, what's, what should be done with other workers and versus what should be done with capitalists. So uh, now in the process of making, beginning to rethink these basic questions, uh, began to look at the, the long history of roughly from, from the time of uh, the Roman Empire to the present of debtors organizations and uh, debtors movements. And I began to try to find out some of the basic commonalities to see if we are in a period that is propitious for debtors movements or not. And uh, I came up with four, and I think there are there are, there are others. And uh, let me and one one thing that I've I've noticed is that uh, debtors' movements, large-scale debtors' movements, that really threatened or, or succeeded in toppling uh, creditor regimes. Uh, were triggered by a period of rapid and substantial increase in the rate of indebtedness. Well, this makes sense, of course. Uh, if suddenly you realize that the person next door and the person down the street is in debt as well as you are, that individuating power of debt gets undermined and makes it possible for you to join in, um, in, in mass movements of sorts. The other thing that I've noticed is that uh, debt struggles seem to be uh, interclass. How often I've found that uh, both in ancient Roman times down to Shays Rebellion and uh, into the struggles against uh, uh, imprisonment for debt that took place in the 19th century, you found many different kinds of people involved, many different kind of class factors involved. Uh, small businessmen, uh, small farmers, uh, workers, wage workers, and uh, often sometimes even well well to do capitalists in different parts of the in different parts of history um, came together and and debt is a very uh, um, potentially unifying force to bring together many types of different kinds of class. Um, factors because in effect uh, debt has many different kinds of characteristics so for example there are f these four types of debt that I just mentioned have different types of classes appropriate to them so often capitalists who borrowed from capitalists would like to not have to pay back as well as workers who have borrowed from capitalists who say this is illegitimate so we often find, when we say there's a debtor struggle, we often find themselves, ourselves seeing a, a struggle that's very, um, that tends to grow very rapidly, but also tends to collapse very quickly. And it's very important to see that. Um, and I spent uh, some time uh, last month and uh, the beginning of this month in Mexico and I've been interviewing people in, uh, in the El Barzan movement, which was the very powerful Mexican uh, debtors uh, union, 
uh, that uh, took shape in the 1990s. And um, what, they, what these veterans of that organization um, told me is of a collapse after gaining half a million members and uh, beginning to have tremendous impact on the, well, basically on the way Mexicans viewed debt, um, the organization really collapsed within two or three years. Um, and I had some very interesting discussions in Mexico about it. And uh, one of the things that became clear is uh, that there's a paradox in the debtors movement. The more successful the organization is, the less attractive it is, since the issue it is defined by seems to be solved. Yes, what it begins to happen in 1998, after reaching its peak in 1996, is that the government, in fact, nationalized the banks and the banks started a process of negotiating hundreds of thousands of different loans. In fact, uh, millions of people felt the effects of, the, of those loans. So, in effect, they pulled the rug under the movement. Um, but... Okay, democracy of speech. Okay, well, your turn is coming soon. Your turn is coming soon. Uh, so, I would like to finish up uh, my, my point by simply saying, if we look at these movements, often they don't, they don't win what they started out to try to win. But many of these movements have transformed the class relationship quite dramatically. And um, it's important to not view victories as uh, uh, c concrete indicators, but as seeing as part of a large, large and longer power relationship that's in the process of changing. And these movements, even if they are short-lived, have a very important uh, role in the transformation of of humanity, you might say, uh, and its relationship to uh, uh, what you owe and who you owe it to, who you do you really need to pay back. Okay, and that's that. Okay, so I'm going to make, uh, before the opening up the discussion, I'm going to make just one simple point uh, uh, after this three uh, very exciting talk. Uh, also, this is uh, my response to the last night uh, Mr. Paul Mason's model of uh, hierarchy vis-a-vis -vis network power. Uh, what I felt the most strongly about these three talks tonight is uh, more like an existential uh, aspect of class struggle, which is like a, what I say, like asymmetry uh, between the uh, essential asymmetry between the ruling uh, capitalist operation state power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, struggles. Uh, this is uh, not only like a good thing about it because it's a form of exploitation, but also this uh, indicates the potency of the movement. How it use it, uh, maybe for instance, uh, tonight's talk about uh, Sylvia was saying uh, in the context of a global uh, uh, division of the reproductive work, but uh, she talks also about this like uh, not only affecting but the cognitive uh, uh, kind of labor that this like, uh, international do domestic workers are actually doing. This is a form of exploitation, but it's a kind of like a power within in itself. Uh, and also like uh, when uh, David talk about, uh, you know, like uh, uh, jobs, uh, it's a, it has a very poignant, sad aspect to it because uh, what you use the word, a uh, capitalist Soviet, you know, increasing, mm -hmm. incessantly creating the division of labor, which is, we don't know what is useful, you know. While like uh, people who have a real, like a uh, necessary job, sanitation workers, reproductive workers, mm -hmm. they are invisible. You know, this relationship is very poignant. But where this, like, uh, really we have to, based upon a struggle, uh, start from, is this. And, uh, you know, this has a many, I can apply many, like, uh, metaphor, uh, 
reiteration from this, maybe those who cook food and those who eat, that kind of everyday situation. Two, between maybe guerrilla warfare, this will be a formal military warfare. Uh, you know, state oppression, it's a mono-directional, uh, just like a violent application of violence, to more like a multi-directional, like a sort of militancy. Maybe like a militarism vis-a-vis -vis militancy, one can say. Uh, all these are like a sort of like a kind of like a, maybe I may be too romantic, but this is a kind of destiny of the struggle. And this is to me like a little more real and useful than a diagrammatic model of hierarchy vis-a-vis -vis network. Because it could uh, include like, a, you know, they, this asymmetry may uh, include network, but net network is not everything because network could be dangerous too. Uh, you know, uh, network includes like a command and control. Uh, uh, I can uh, give more examples, but anyway, so my, uh, you know, comment basically tonight is this like uh, asymmetry, existential asymmetry vis-a-vis -vis the uh, power operation and struggle. And uh, maybe this issue, uh, you know, I hope like in relationship with these wonderful talks, uh, we can open up now and, uh, you know, discuss in the different context of our struggles. Hi, I am uh, out of the United States and I'm in Wisconsin. So I have two quick questions. So one, uh, thinking about invisibility and visibility and workers, um, I take a grave issue with saying that there really isn't a middle class and they're all workers. So I think about people like my father who are incarcerated, who are forced to work under state rule or under government sanction. And where do they fit in this class narrative around work, forced labor, debt? Um, and then also, I think about, um, you know, a, a quick reflection of the Wisconsin uprising, which was talked about as a workers' uprising, but I was there all day, every day, and it was not a general workers' uprising. And I was there when the middle class white folks sold out the poor black and brown workers. So just keeping that in mind. And then also, um, I didn't hear the word race at all. And so I'm thinking about, you know, where does that fit in in terms of how we understand class, struggle, and movement building in general. I'm not entirely convinced that there's been this great shift in uh, class status that has formed non-traditional allyships. Who wants to take that? Um, so, so I do questions from yeah, directly? Yeah, yeah. What do we do? Oh, moderate? Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm not reading, but I will now. All right. So I kind of want to piggyback on uh, on M's point. Um, uh, I appreciate all the discussion that has happened. I think this is a wonderful conference. I think it is always troubling when we have a discussion about class, particularly intra-class issues, such as uh, debt, and such as whether you know the difference between a middle class, if, if one theoretically exists, or other classes, uh, without a mention of either race or gender. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's it's very troubling when we have a discussion about class, particularly intra-class issues that relate to uh, such as debt and such as um, uh, uh, whether or not there's a middle class uh, or what the character of that middle class is without a discussion, an explicit discussion about either race or gender. So on the debt part in particular, uh, the student debt issue, uh, forgiving student debt is something that's taking off. It's something that I support. I think it's a very, very important issue, and I think it has wide and broad support in all segments of at least U.S. society. Uh, uh, however, if you were to go into black communities, you wouldn't find an uprising for student debt relief because most black people don't go to college. So there'll be no impetus there to have a student debt rise. Although I think most black people support the end of student debt. The question isn't do 
low-income people, particularly people of color, support the end of, of, uh, of things like student debt. The question is, do college graduates with good jobs who don't want to be splitting their payment, who want a bigger house and can't get a bigger house because they have a debt payment, do they support the end of debt payments that poor people are making when they have to pay extra to get their water turned back on, when they have to pay extra because they were not able to pay insurance and now they have to pay an insurance fee, when they have to pay extra to get their electricity turned back on, and those kinds of debts. And I would suggest that the support of poor people of color for issues that impact mostly whites, such as student debt, is way higher than it is for the reverse. And that's a real class issue that has to be addressed. Mm, that's true, yeah. As it relates okay. to okay. Uh, as it relates to things such as the the um, uh, uh, you know so-called middle class, but but particularly as it relates to something like Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street was very powerful, really influential, obviously. I went to many Occupy Wall Street things as well as Occupy uh, occupies around the uh, United States. Uh, but again, Occupy, mainly white, seemed to take on issues which impacted mainly white people. In the United States, 70%, over 70% of whites own their own home or live in a house that is owned by their parents. Consequently, when the foreclosure issue came up and Occupy Homes came up, the primary demand there was uh, principal reduction. That they wanted people who were facing uh, foreclosure to get principal reduction. There's never been one moment in U.S. history where 50% where half of black people own their own home or lived in a house that was owned by their parents. So even if you were getting 100% principal reduction, you would never help the majority of black people. The black people would instead support something like an expansion of public housing or uh, rent control, things like that. How many Occupy Wall Street people who are pushing for foreclosure uh, debt relief would be pushing for more public housing? who will be pushing for the end of these extreme prison sentences. So I think the race, it is impossible to talk about class without talking about race. And this is without even bringing up the very, very real um, immigrant issues, which was addressed somewhat with the domestic workers, uh, but without bringing the very, very real immigrant issues, which are uh, tearing apart what would be called the working class in Europe as well as the United States. Since those two questions are quite related to each other, yeah, would you prefer to take, come back yeah. first and then we can take yeah, more no, questions? I, 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 I feel like it's, it, no. the two questions were yeah, very I'll, I'll speak to yeah, quite so important to, to Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm really sorry I didn't emphasize uh, that because I, I, I mean, for example, when I was giving that whole analysis of, of like sort of uh, working class pop, uh, right wing populism, it's an exclusively white phenomena. It's an, and that's really significant um, because it's based on a form of anti-intellectualism. I mean, you know, race in, in the US especially, I mean, God, uh, you can't talk about any of this without talking about race, and I, 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 I shouldn't have tried. Um, you know, what I've written about, I very much emphasize that it is a white phenomena which doesn't affect uh, working class black people or people of color in general at all, immigrant communities, because it plays on an anti-intellectualism against culturally that is like very white I mean it's like you know um, it isn't really shared by anybody else um, and and thus it's much easier for those class alliances and I think you're right that that you know um, people of color uh, you know are much more supporting uh, shifting to supporting class alliances of white people who think people are willing to do it back again, I mean, God knows. Uh, but like, it, in fact, that was one of the phenomena that really struck me in Occupy. You know, I was talking about these new class alliances based on debt. Um, to some degree, there are also racial alliances. I mean, for example, the Transit Workers Union that I mentioned, uh, overwhelmingly African-American union, uh, but it was one of the biggest supporters of these sort of white student debt um, victims. And I thought that was really significant um, because it, it's not, I mean, it's true. Home ownership, on the one hand, white, um, you know, overwhelmingly more white of families proportionally, uh, but people victims of subprime mortgages, overwhelmingly people of color. So, I mean, it does actually cut both ways. Um, I mean, whereas white, uh, there are more white homeowners, home, homeowners affected, people of color are, are like much more screwed when they enter into those sort of economic relationships. Um, and I think that actually did play a role of creating certain types of alliances that hadn't existed before. Now, like, uh, you know, it, are the, the 
white parties to those alliances blinded by their own privilege, um, ultimately doing uh, overlooking the issues that are most important to their allies? Probably, yeah, that's true. I mean, I think um, it generally tends to happen in these alliances. I mean, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but um, at least those alliances are starting to exist, so there's a possibility that maybe it's not going to happen this time. And what's been your impression of this? Well, my impression is that uh, just to, just to speak directly to the point about uh, student debt, uh, student loan debt, um, student loan debt operates not only in uh, colleges and universities, but also for vocational schools mm -hmm. and for-profit colleges and universities. And much of the um, student debt that has been accumulated, actually, is um, basically uh, a African-American students who have gone to many of these colleges uh, or vocational schools and have uh, tri paid um, money garnered from, from debt uh, and uh, then discovered, of course, that uh, the results of, that, of, of their uh, education in these places does not make them available for uh, employment. So often they're stuck with uh, a debt and with no, no, no improved employment possibilities. So actually, the, the biggest uh, supporters, in the sense of uh, those who are especially in need of transformation of student debt, are the African American and uh, Latino uh, youth that have going to these places to transform themselves and getting themselves in the contrary in debt and uh, with a worthless piece of paper as a consequence. So the, in that sense, uh, the uh, questions, these questions are, apply uh, in different ways to different parts of the uh, class composition and racial composition in the United States. Um, it, one thing that has happened in, under the, um, in, the, in the Clinton period and beginning in the, in the Bush period was, in fact, a noticeable increase in black and uh, Latino home ownership uh, compared to the past. And of course, that's been wiped out in the last period uh, since 2008. And um, so th that, that, the, that extra uh, spike in the home ownership of African Americans and Latinos, uh, in effect, has been wiped out because of the, the sub subprime the mortgage, mortgage story. And so therefore, I think uh, if that form of, of housing uh, is the, the form of housing that uh, we, we politically want to support, then in fact, changes in the principle might be of, of importance and help to that, that part of the, uh, the working class that, well, found themselves uh, foreclosed. And, um, that, uh, so I, I would just say uh, debt is very complicated. Mm -hmm. It has a, a racial composition as well in the United States. And uh, even though it might not appear to be that way, as in the case of the, the student debt story, I think it is. And uh, we, we have a lot of... Um, um, and uh, the whole... I, I see debt in the United States something like uh, Dante's Inferno. There are many circles of hell. And many different pe The racial composition, of course, also is, is, is indicated by the, the different circles. So I think um, it's... It, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm new at this. It's, it's, it's a, a part... I'm beginning to learn about debt uh, in my 60s, and uh, and one thing that I've realized is that uh, a lot of my categories need to be transformed to to think about this story from the point of view of the debt relation, including my racial categories. Okay, I'm gonna take some more questions. I have two here. Um, I have a question for, uh, for David, um, and my question is um, about work rather than debt. Um, one of the greatest, I think, uh, writer, activist, critics of, uh, or 
writers about the, the revolutionary struggle for meaningful work was the late 19th century critic of, of capitalism, William Morris. And in his uh, utopian work, News from Nowhere, he depicts a world in which all work has become pleasurable for one of three reasons, either because it's become a pleasurable habit, or because, second, because of the social honor that it brings, or because of the conscious, sensuous pleasure that people take in work itself. In other words, work has become a form of art. And Marx, of course, disagreed, and he, he argued that, uh, you know, that um, uh, the realm of freedom only could begin where the realm of necessary labor ended. So my question to you is this, do you think that, um, that Morris's utopian vision is a realistic one for the contemporary era of what you're describing, the era, the era of uh, ever-expanding uh, bullshit work? <laughs> um, okay, sure. One more uh, Morris. I am a member of a, um, a, a movement here in Holland that's called Dwang uh, Arbeid uh, Ne, and that, is, uh, that means uh, against forced labor. Uh -huh. Forced labor in Holland is being institu institutionalized. Uh -huh. It is happening right now. It has passed through the Tweede uh, Kamer, uh, how you call it, I don't remember how to say it in English, the, through the parliament, and uh, it's being enforced right now. So I do not know how much acquainted you are with us, this development, uh, yourself and the public in general, but I would like to hear something from you if you have something to say about that. Uh, we are finding very much difficulties uh, starting the resistance. Mm. Although we have uh, 800,000 uh, people who receive social money because those are the ones who are being forced, and 300,000 are, well, I won't get into details because it won't mean much to you at this moment. Although this number of four, uh, people who are, have been slowly, slowly pushed into forced labor, uh, there is little awareness and uh, almost no resistance. Uh, that's one comment I want to make. Uh, number two, tomorrow at around 12, there is a demonstration around the dam against a racist uh, tradition that is called the Zwarte Pit. So if you have time and you want to come and support for half an hour, an hour, please come and do so. Then I'm going to make a comment that maybe some of my acquaintances won't like to hear it, but I was involved at the very beginning of the workers, uh, uh, the, um, how you, the cleaning workers uh, struggle. And that's something that uh, relates to what you said, uh, uh, George. Yeah. Um, I think that you have a little bit of a romantic idea of what uh, uh, really is happening in Holland. It's not a big uh, movement, uh, although the, there were very good efforts to make it work. There are some uh, uh, um, r good results, but basically uh, uh, there is very little uh, uh, achieved in this subject and in any other uh, 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 subject, uh, but that has to do with something that probably is going to be very unpopular with what I'm going to say right now, is because uh, the quality, or not the quality, but the, the, the orientation of the, uh, um, uh, of the immigrants, you can divide in two kinds. One kind is the immigrant that's coming here because they have no choice but they are forced by war or by political persecution to go somewhere else where actually they would have, never have want to go there. And the other group of people are those who come with the American dream or the uh, European dream. And those people, they identify themselves with a, a um, capitalist ideal. So a lot of support from this group, although they might be very down uh, uh, in the everyday life, will be very difficult to bring up because the awareness is very slow, uh, very, very low. Uh, that's what I have to say. Maybe you have something to react on that. Thank you. Good night. I represent a foundation called uh, Barm Hearty. I represent a foundation called Barm Hearty Hate. 
as a spiritual nourishment. And what I have to say is that, well, we've been talking here about different, about classes, about debts, about immigrants, and about race. And I think the same as psychoanalysis, we can start to discuss and go backward two or three lives or 20 different authors. I think we all know what's happening right now in the world. Here is people from many, many countries. And we are trying to find actions and attitudes to, to face what is happening to us in the whole world. Everywhere we have almost the same violence from the police. Everywhere we are, have been deceived in different ways, like in the pension funds. And yeah, I think the, pension, the neoliberals, I think everybody knows who I'm talking about when I say neoliberals or liberals. They are really the one who has been transforming this world because before they come into life, we still have the possibility in the whole world to decide and make our laws. But today, these people have been, first of all, trying to change the constitutions because in the past, the constitutions were done to defend the citizens. Instead of that, when they change the constitution, they start to defend the capitals. So what I want to say as a commentary here is that we first of all have to individualize very well our enemy, and that is neoliberalism, which is working as a mafia, telling themselves because it's an elite. And here we have been talking very much about uh, problems in America, but the problems are almost the same in the whole world. So to finish, I would like to, to please try to gather all the ideas and give us a bit of ways to defend ourselves. Because the Occupy, Occupy uh, movement that started in Spain and in America and then here in Holland has been infiltrated as many, many other big organizations. Also, the trade unions organizations, with who I've been having contact direct here and in Chile, and I realize, like it or not, they are infiltrated and paid also by those neoliberals. I would just like very short to say something about the domestic workers since Sylvia isn't here. I think mm -hmm. uh, I could also say something. It's not a, so much only about how much the, what would happen here in the Netherlands. I think the domestic workers and the migration of the domestic workers all, all over the world has made incredible changes by making their, their work, their labor visible. And I think the visibility of something that before was not seen, household work, uh, and which is something that has not existed apparently as labor, though it's been you know, the support of all, our whole society. I think that is something that the domestic workers movement has reached as a result, and which is the ILO recognition, which is a fantastic result, I think, which has made it visible in a way that it has never been before. So even though the workers in the Netherlands have not reached an, a result yet that we would like, but it's still, I think, an incredible accomplishment. Hey. Uh, I mean, if I could say something in the first one, I think that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to do that? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, the first one is a question. I, uh, just briefly, um, uh, about forms of labor. I, I think that one, I mean, one reason, like I was talking about work, and I think George was talking about that, I think it tells us something about what neoliberalism is really about, because neoliberalism is, um, I, I really believe that neoliberalism is basically a political rather than an economic movement. It's, it's all about prioritizing the political over the economic. Um, pardon? 
Thank you all. I think this. Um, all right. Um, I, I actually think that given a choice between doing two things, one of which um, you know will make capitalism seem like the only possible system or reinforce capitalism politically, and doing another thing which will make capitalism actually be a more viable system, neoliberals always choose the former. And it's always about prioritizing political imperatives over the actual sustainability of the system. So in a certain, um, and, and, and what I think they've discovered is that the two, there are two biggest ideological weapons are the morality of debt and the morality of work. That the two things that seem to really work on a popular level is like people really seem to think that people who don't pay their debts are de deadbeats or bad people, uh, they don't deserve anything, and they really seem to believe that, or it's easy to convince people, that anybody who doesn't like work more than they'd like at something they don't really enjoy doing, you know, anybody who doesn't do that is a bad person and doesn't deserve anything. Um, and so they just hammer away at this stuff, and it's a paradox, because if you look at people in the ruling class, they kind of realize that they're... They're, they're crashing into a wall. I mean, they've created this financial structure that's totally unsustainable. They've created ecological structure that's totally unsustainable doing, by, by constantly increasing amounts of work. Um, you know, in a way, they're a waste on their own batard. They're, they're destroyed by their own ideological commitments to constantly increasing amounts of work and increasing amounts of debt, which comes out of the same thing, ultimately, uh, in, in practice. Um, and, um, and, and, and I don't almost recognize it. In doing so, they're, they're trashing the system they're trying to maintain. So um, the system is smashing into a wall, but they're not going to stop it because they realize the only thing holding it up is that ideological hold they have over people through those, sort of, those twin moralities. So I think that there's no more important area to intervene if we're talking about crashing the system. The system is crashing itself. Uh, it's being held together largely by, um, A, the fact that they've fought the successful war in the imagination for the last 30 years, so nobody can imagine anything else ever happening um, other than some variation of, of financialized capitalism. And um, these, these sort of moral weapons. I mean, nobody's really even arguing that capitalism is a good system anymore. They're arguing that, A, it's the only thing that could exist, or like, you know, shut up, or because if you don't follow the rules, you're, 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 you're personally wicked. Um, if we can reverse that morality, the whole thing is like likely to fall apart. <laughs> Perhaps so, yes. <laughs> yes, lots of questions. Mm -hmm. ah. There's a question, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, very striking by the panel uh, because it's all about uh, labor and debt. Mm -hmm. And George uh, Dyke was very interesting on the paper. It's like why we don't have a debt movement. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask why we don't have a workers movement. Uh, because the past at least, I don't know, years that I've been involved in struggles, it's so difficult to have a strong workers movement. Not unions movement, not syndicalist movements, but workers movement. And I think that the issue that you brought, George, about the debt layers and the different mm -hmm. problematics of debt, I think is very connected of like work and labor and how we, how we understand ourselves as workers and how we understand our you know, labor. But it, that is very connected of how we organ, how we organize and also in connection to debt. Because most of us, we're working and most of us, we are on debt. But if we don't have a, a strong workers' movement, how we can have a strong debts movement? You know, I think they are very related to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we had a lot of calls for strikes and a lot of uh, 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 efforts for general strikes, most of them were called by unions, but they were never driven by uh, the grounds of the workers, and they were, it, they were very, very small portions of uh, workers' movement in the years that I've been involved in these things. Thank you. Uh, I want to yeah. Um, do we want to do more questions? Or Maybe do I'll take a couple more. Okay. If that's okay with sure. you. Sure. Uh, I don't know where to go. I'm going to go, I'm gonna run way back there. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, it's not a question. Actually, I feel a little anger because of this comment about uh, w what you just said about the uh, migrants and uh, that uh, you know that you, you said your opinion, but you tramped with your boots on a kind of very interesting construction that is very empowering, that is paradigmatic and transformative for, for our co consciousness of this subject, of a feminist subject. And maybe you are not aware of it, or maybe you felt it because you said oh, I don't know who will be upset about it. And indeed, I'm very upset because of that, because who are you to speak about the immigrants and, uh, yeah, what they are thinking? They are thinking, oh, they are... They are either victims, powerless, they don't know what, how to deal with it, or they have the kind of colonial head in there, the American dream. I'm sorry, I don't think this is appropriate. Uh, I don't. I don't know who went first down oh, here. Huh? Here, I'm just going to go right here because I don't want to do that silly running thing again. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, what I had a uh, couple of comments about uh, why we don't have strong movements is because uh, humans tend to be forgetful. We uh, forget things pretty fast. And sometimes what happens is that there was an experiment with a frog. If you all know, if a frog goes to a very hot water, it jumps up pretty fast. But what they did, they put the frog in a, uh, in a pan and they started heating up the water. And then suddenly the frog wanted to jump off, but it couldn't anymore. So, because it was paralyzed. Um, I think this is, this is what happened to many people, many of us forget, and uh, many others are paralyzed. So we have a lot of problems. We have to look, uh, not only American side of it, I think we have to more look more global because the boundaries are going out and the boundaries are getting uh, uh, wiped out. Uh, we don't have any uh, borders anymore. People are everywhere, every country you go, you have different nationalities. So I think we have to understand the whole picture and try to have a global solution for it. So that's my comment. Thank you. Maybe just one more and then we'll... Sure. Thanks a lot. I also wanted to react to you. The idea, uh, there's many things being said, and I think one of the most important things that we have to do right here that should be sort of our agenda is to find, um, let's say, categories that transcend all our different struggles. We mentioned a few. There's a race, um, uh, there's gender, there's housing or, or at least different kinds of ownership, because I'm, I'm also much more in favor of the public one. I, I would, for myself, mention education. But the thing about the cleaners in Holland, Although it may not have been as big as we all would have wanted it to be, this is obviously true because every, all our struggles should be bigger. The division that you mentioned between, let's say, political fugitives and economic fugitives, I don't know how that is in the rest of the world, but in Holland it is a very mainstream and pretty problematic division, especially for somebody who says that Black Pete is racism. Uh, because I think that is basically already almost at least a very discriminatory, maybe even a racist discrimination, and you should never, ever make it. That was what I wanted to say. I have a very loud voice. because I am a member of this community, but one answer to you, lady, I am an immigrant here, although I am Dutch and I'm gonna fight for my right to demand that everybody of you will call me only Dutch. I am an immigrant and I do know exactly how my community behaves. And, uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you want to lay the cause it's okay, it's your right, but, but, uh, uh, if people want to uh, close their eyes, don't want to see the development just because they want a little boost, I can understand that, but it's not going to help. It's just not going to help. Just accept things the way they are, and we are going to make better. And we have to make more effort to make things work better. 
very simple. Don't, don't romanticize what you don't have. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe you can respond to some of the, the comments, questions. Okay. Oh, she's, she's... oh um, if you want to do something? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak. But... <laughs> I can say something too. Yeah. Well, I, let me just uh, speak to a couple of the issues that were brought up. A very interesting discussion, and I'm sure we can go on quite a long time about it. Um, but one thing that I must say is that we've transformed our conception of what work is in the last uh, 40 years, for sure. There was a long period of time where our notion of work was rooted in the factory and in the wage. That was the, the model. If, um, if work is taking place, it's, being taken, it's taking place in a specific area and with a particular wage attached to it. And it was contractual, it was legal, right, and uncoerced. But in actual fact, what we've discovered in the, the anti-colonial movement, the feminist movements, have shown us that in fact, work that capitalism has been using has been taking place outside of that charmed circle of waged, contractually fixed, and legal work. The, the, the sphere of work is much larger, and what we're now beginning to discover is that, of course, slavery is a very much, it hasn't gone away. I mean, when I read, for example, about the drug gangs of, um, uh, of Mexico, uh, I, I, I read slavery there. There's a tremendous amount of slavery in this type of criminality, this huge industry that's taking place. And when we read about 55,000 uh, 55, people being killed in the last 10 years or so, what we're seeing is, is an enslavement, enslavement process. So w when we, we think about it, why are we losing the, the, these, these struggles? It's because this area has been tremendously increased. And the... the well, uh, think about what's happened in the last 20 years in terms of what neoliberalism has meant. It has meant the coming on to the labor market of more than a billion people, for example. It means the mafia, you're quite right. It means, but mafia... In a, uh, yeah, but w when we talk about Mexico, we're talking about very you know, local capitalists who are part of an international network. So these are... What has happened is that we've now begun to understand where we're really at. And I think that that's, it's become sobering, as far as I, for me, I'm beginning to understand. At the same time, we have now opened up the area of struggle and, and made it a much wider area. And that's why this issue of debt is so important. For, Marx didn't write about the debt of the working class. So those who follow Marx say, oh, okay, well, that, that couldn't be that important. Well, it probably wasn't in 1860. But right now, you can't talk about the class struggle unless you talk about debt. Yeah. Uh, we talk about that when we're in the We love it. Yeah, an answer to George's question also. I, okay. Um, but, oh, you, you had something, George? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was I was just suggesting or wondering if that is a form of criminalization or um, mm -hmm. an an, em an emotional you know like feeling criminal by doing certain work that is not placed in a certain is in a certain uh, location. At the same time, you have a responsibility to pay off what you do mm -hmm. or to understand some kind of labor that is not very particularly um, um, uh, located either in time or in space, but is only located by debt. Mm -hmm. um, well, one way to say that, actually, I, I always used like a, a, a horror movie metaphor for that phenomena, um, what I think you're talking about, is, you know, you know how it is in, in horror movies, the movies that 
I mean, the, the monsters that always seem to be the scariest are the ones that turn you into themselves, like vampires or werewolves or zombies, right? Um, you don't just die, you, you become a monster. But, but the thing is, like, you know, if you get bit by a vampire, you don't get to be the cool count vampire. You get to be like the, the pathetic flunky vampire, you know? And um, so it's even worse. And in a way, that's what debt does. It, turns you, it forces you to think like a capitalist, because you have to think about money all the time and how you're going to get money. But you're the wo most pathetic thing on earth. You're a capitalist with no capital. Right, um, so you just turn into the horror image of capitalism, um, and and in a sense, that's that's why it's such a powerful ideological weapon. And in a way, that's both well, the bullshit jobs are doing the same thing. They give you these jobs where you're working all the time, even though it's completely meaningless. But you're in you, you're in the sort of perspective of management rather than labor. Um, so they take these people who would otherwise be part of the structurally unemployed, and they give them these utterly meaningless jobs, where nonetheless they have to think like from the perspective of capitalists. So all these things are these ideological positions. But also, debt is also like destroys workers' movements in another way, which is very explicit. Like people like Alan Greenspan just said this straight out. Um, they said it's really important that as many people as possible are in debt because then they can't strike. Uh, wages will go down. You know, if you're going to lose your house, if you go out uh, um, on strike, then you're not going to do it. So um, it was very intentional strategy to destroy the labor movement, drive down wages um, through mass indebtedness. Um, so, so it's not only just it's thinking like a capitalist, but but you know, hobble, hobbles workers directly. Um, but but I think that the problem of organizing there was always a fundamental problem of organizing around workers' issues. So I think that um, we've come to terms with more, which is that most people don't want to be factory workers. And most people who are factory workers are like hoping their kids are not going to be that for obvious reasons, you know? Um, and, and it's like you were saying, like debtors' movements is hard to maintain because if they achieve their games, you're not in debt anymore, so there's no more movement. Po same thing with movements about poverty. You know, your aim is not to be poor, but that destroys the basis of the movement. But I think the same is true of being proletarian. Most people, you know, who are proletarian want their kids not to be proletarian, and, and they have values which come out of being working class. But like, you know, it becomes this crisis because they actually value, like, you know, not having a stick up your ass and not like valuing money over social relations and all these sort of working class values. But the only way to preserve them is to think of them as ethnic values, or you know, I'm Polish, I'm Irish, I'm the, you know, as a, in America this happens all the time, rather than as working class, because that at least you can convey to your kids, which you don't want to convey working classness to your kids. Um, but so I think that we, we need to like come up with a. That's why I say it's so important to reach change what we think work is, you know, to something we actually still want to be doing, which is like taking care of each other. I mean, that's its ultimately value, because like a, a value, because no matter what the social relations, we do want to take care of our kids, we do want to like have have, have nice things. We want to do things in our lives that benefit other people. So if we, And this is why, actually, I think that the distinction between productive labor and reproductive labor. I mean, yes, it makes sense from the perspective of capital, and in, in, in so far as you're a Marxist, Marx is like trying to understand the logic of capital, um, you know, you can use terms like that, but I really object to, like, distinguishing between productive and reproductive labor. So women are doing this intrinsically bi biologized, you know, secondary thing, which is, supports creating pr commodities, which is apparently the most important thing. Uh, yeah, that's true from, from the perspective of capitalism. That's why capitalism is fucked up and perverse, and that's why we don't like it. Um, we don't want to reproduce those categories in our own analysis. So why don't we start from the idea that like what they call, capitalism calls reproductive labor actually is productive labor, because that's what we do in life. We create each other and, you know, in the kind of life that we want to have, um, and thus define working around things that we still want to do after the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, George, do you have anything else that you'd like to say? Yeah. What? No, uh, right now, there's a lot to say. Um, but in, in order to uh, finish up our discussion, uh, I think that the, the there's, uh, at this point, it would be very important for us to think about our own conference as a model for the kind of uh, issues that we've been dealing with here, issues of race and gender, um, and begin to think uh, and use this time uh, <laughs> uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, and, and, and tomorrow you, you made the announcement that there is uh, going to be a gathering at the end of the conference for us to rethink these issues that we've been talking about and apply them self-reflexively to ourselves. Oh. 
And I think that would be an important opportunity to actually begin to go from thought to action in this, in this matter. Uh, because th these kind of gatherings are vital. And uh, it would be, it's, it's really important for us to be able to put them together in ways that are going to be effective and recompose us instead of decompose us. And that, that's, that's my final word on the matter. So we'll see you then tomorrow, certainly, at was it 6.30, uh, in just across the street here. Okay, so we'll see you then tomorrow. Okay. I want to thank everybody for coming out again today. Sorry for my silly running routine. We got a little tired. Uh, but tomorrow everything starts a little bit later. Uh, it starts around 11 a.m. Uh, so go to the Frankreich, have a good time tonight, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks again for coming out. Okay, everybody.